All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Rachel Spence, and I'm here at the Coburg Public Library. Very happy to be introducing our talented, best-selling author, Kate Hilton, um, who is the author of The Hole in the Middle, Just Like Family, and the forthcoming novel, Better Luck Next Time. Um, Kate is an experienced media contributor and has appeared on various local and regional shows and lives in Toronto with her blended family. Um, and then we also have Ashley Pem Peminter? Peminter, yeah, you got it. Wonderful, <laughs> who is a content creator for Girl Guides of Canada and currently co-chair of the Ontario Library Association's Red Maple Award Steering Committee. She is also a contributing reviewer to the Canadian Children's Book News. So she's used to interviewing children's authors. This is gonna be a very fun interview for her with, um, with Kate. Um, so anyways, let's get this started, ladies. So I will hand it over to you and thank you so much, both of you for being here for us. Thank you, Rachel. Kate, this is a pleasure. I'm so excited to talk to a grown-up about their books. Um, and you'll probably notice though that there's still like some of like the kids' questions. They always sneak in because you just like, there's always that little like the reader at heart. Um, so let's jump in. Um, okay, so we're, great. this book, Better Luck Next Time. I hope it's not backwards for you because it always shows it backwards on my screen. No, it looks perfect. It looks beautiful. Um, is a fantastic novel that is a, a bit of a follow-on to A Hole in the Middle. Um, mm -hmm. But it's very nice because it also diverges. So instead of just picking up where you left off, you like built out this whole new world. Um, and I want to ask you a little bit about that writing process that you, sure. you took in order to get here to this novel now versus like some of your earlier works. Well, so this novel, um, you know, it's funny. Sometimes the patterns only are really visible to you as a writer in hindsight, to be totally candid with you. So I, um, my, I've written three novels, and the one I'm writing now is a complete departure. I'm now doing uh, a historical mystery. But with the first three novels, um, I think of them in hindsight as kind of a marriage trilogy, that there are three comic, domestic, uh, and also workplace novels that are about midlife women confronting um, their sense of identity within and without the married state, right? And so uh, in a variety of ways. So the first book, um, which was kind of my midlife passion project, I mean, I was at that time uh, in the first novel, it's uh, the protagonist is a woman named Sophie. She has a huge job. She has young kids. There's some cracks in her marriage and someone from her past comes into her life. And I was living um, a life where I was really um, with a very busy job, with very young kids, with a spouse who worked all the time, um, with a lot of volunteer commitments, like really on that hamster wheel of achievement and having it all. And kind of at around the eight, in my late 30s, so kind of in that prime era for um, identity uh, questioning. And really started to think about this promise that Gen X women had been given about having it all and whether that promise had kind of any real substance to it. And so that was the sort of um, genesis of, of the hole in the middle, which did very well for me because it clearly hit a nerve with a lot of other women in my age bracket um, who were struggling with this uh, incessant juggling act and really coming to kind of um, push back on this lean in idea. It's right? like I'm leaning in so far I'm on the floor, right? <laughs> so tell me how we could, is this really, really the promise? Like, because I don't, you know, the promise you've sold me, like I'm living the dream and the dream, like I just want to be asleep, right? <laughs> like, just like, let me sleep for 10 days and then we can talk about whether I want to return to this life. So that was, that was kind of where the first book uh, came from. And then in the second book, I was really interested in kind of the, um, the, the protagonist is, is a woman who is not married, had, had a, has a very short starter marriage, and in her present life is a, an extremely career-focused political staffer to a charismatic mayor, um, and has a long-term live-in partner who wants to get married, and she's sort of thinking you know, is that really the direction I want to go? And she's very, very invested in her career achievement. So it's just another take on how we invest our passions, where our legacy is, and kind of how do we think about um, the things that feed us and what we want to put back into the world. So that's the second book. 
And then the third book is about what happens, uh, and that's a book we're talking about today, so this is a very long intro, um, is about what happens when the plans you've laid, so it kind of looks back on the on the protagonists of the first two books and where they've ended up, it's sort of like, I'm, now I'm charting this course, this is my choice. What happens when your plans go awry? You know, when there's like a major plot twist, like you've decided, okay, this is what I'm doing with my life. This is the course I'm setting out upon and I've got it all figured out, right? I'm, I'm now 40 and I've figured it all out. And then somewhere in, the, in your 40s, there's a huge plot twist everything you thought you knew falls apart and where do you go from there and that's what better left next time is about so with respect to the characters you know um there are so many little threads that come together to form sort of the germinal seed of a novel and you know the sort of overarching theme is obviously one so for better luck next time as i've already kind of alluded to it was for me an idea of reinvention of like putting the pieces back together and creating something new and and feeling excited and renewed about a new possibility and then ultimately kind of multiple possibilities that might flow from that and it's kind of letting go of this idea of there's one plan <laughs> you're on this one track right and coming to kind of accept that you know, we're always in a state of reinvention, right? And we're always in a state of, if we're growing, we're taking risks, we're failing at those, some of those risks, and some of them are coming through and we're trying to figure out always at how to grapple with being in a state of growth, right? And change and coming to accept that change is kind of part of being human, right? So that's kind of the underlying kind of theme of Better Luck Next Time. But of course, when you're writing a novel, um, you know, that doesn't fill a book, right? Like, <laughs> one theme does not a book make. And so then you're into what are a lot of the other things that are kind of kicking around in your brain at any given time that you are going to throw into the, you know, the soup of the book. Um, you've now heard me about use 20 metaphors or so about <laughs> books, right? Because it's all, you know, it, it's, it, it is um, a, a creative process. So like, there are lots of cooking metaphors that make sense, but you're, you're adding things as you go because you should start writing the book. You realize like that's a good idea and those are a couple of really great characters. That's going to take me to about chapter six and then I've really got to add some stuff, right? And so, um, and so then you start kind of pulling in other things. So in my case it was I got very interested in intergenerational feminism that had been kicking around in my head uh, through the Trump years um, and the women's marches and kind of the different, I'm a parent, of course, so I've got teenagers who have their own kind of take on feminism and very connected to older friends and mother and other people who are kind of much more part of the second wave and thinking about how all of those different generations see themselves in a feminist kind of framework. So that's in the book. Um, and then in terms of the characters, like the first book, I sort of thought, you know, you think you're done with characters, right? And then sometimes the secondary characters just kind of stick around and you start to get curious about what are they doing, you know? And and so Will Shannon is a character, Zoe Hennessy too, to a lesser degree, but Will Shannon was sticky for me, you know? Like he's in the first book, he's a secondary character, I don't want to do a spoiler, but he doesn't, you know, he kind of drifts off at the end of the book and you're like, that guy, you know, I'm not done with that guy. That guy's still got some growing to do, right? What happens to him? Um, and so he popped up just for a second in the second book, and then by the time the third book rolled around, I thought, I want to spend more time with him. Yeah, so that's why he's in the third book, and now I feel like I'm done with him. I feel like I <laughs> like, spent enough time and figured him out. Um, similarly, I was asked at a book club last night, you know, or their unfinished, their unfinished business, in this book, you know, there's always that because there are always characters who you just don't have the opportunity to spend as much time with, who you think. So in this book, I feel like Nina is a really interesting character and Zach's a really interesting character. And, you know, I could write a whole book about them, but right now I don't really have an idea for them. But someday, it wouldn't surprise me at all if I'm sitting here and I think, oh, I wonder what Zach's up to. And then that's sort of, that can become the beginning of a new book. 
That's awesome. I love your answer. You answered so many of my questions all in like one beautifully succinct way. And I was like, oh yeah, I was going to ask her about her feminist views. <laughs> love that through and like, look at it, nailed it. Um, and it's really nice. Like, it's also nice to read about that intergenerational feminism in a way that isn't throwing your characters into deep conflict. And it's lovely that you didn't need it. Like you, it's almost like the conflict happened prior to the novel with the with the show that Zach had done and like some of that weird family drama that you threw yeah. in, which was beautifully done. I love the things Thank that you did you. off off book as much as you did on book. And like little plug to this novel. So for readers who are new to Kate Hilton and may not have read Hole in the Middle, I highly recommend reading them back to back. It was so fun. Um, oh, it's good. delightful. And I'm I so totally agree with you. <laughs> about Will Shannon. Yes. I really I really love the direction and growth that you pulled with him. So, no spoilers, but I highly recommend like Thank you. Keep going with it. It was great. Um Having what, said that you don't have to read, you know, it's a standalone. Yes. You don't have to read the first one to read the second one. You can read the second one first, but it's yeah. But if you yeah. like that character and you want to spend more time with him, you have a whole other book. Yeah, I wasn't sure how I felt about him. Now I know how I feel about him. There you so, go. Thank Good. you very much. As a reader, I thank you for that. Uh, awesome. <laughs> have well, everybody's read and is feeling that way? You're, thank you. Um, you what, know, I often think, sorry, I just throw one oh, little thing in, which is that like we do, as writers, you know, our, our choices are so idiosyncratic, like why are there so many different books in the world? Because we like write the books that we want to read, right? And so our choices as writers are very attached to our choices as readers. Um, and so you'll see things pop up in my books that reflect all kinds of different books that I've loved or ideas that I've loved. Um, and, you know, like all of the things that we're talking about are just things that kind of fascinate me when I read other people's books. Um, so, yeah. So I, you know, like a, like a reader in the same way, I was like, I want to know more, <laughs> you know? And so that book can only exist if I write it, you know? <laughs> One of the things that you'd sort of touched on with the intergenerational feminism and the, and the like is you also played with a lot of different perspectives in this novel which is like, as a reader, it's always fun to, to do that shift. And one of the nice things that you did, as opposed to what some other authors did, is that you kept them with a similar voice, but with different stories. So you didn't try and write a, a new voice for every single character outside right. of their actual text. Right. Um, which I think in a novel like this would have been really hard on a reader. <laughs> and probably hard on you too to try and like keep all of that together. And I'm wondering if there were any characters in this book, now we're going to like, kids lit Ashley's coming in uh, are there any characters in this book that were easier for you to step into when you were writing for them yeah I mean I think that's true so Bayada is a bigger stretch for me she's um so so there are uh there are three women who are the main voices of the book um and the book is told from their points of view um, Mariana and Beata are sisters, and then Zoe is their cousin. Um, and so those are the three main voices. So Zoe is kind of a hard-hitting PR executive. She owns her own business. She has just gone through a very, uh, it should not have been unexpected, but it was <laughs> unexpected. So her, she is someone who is very attached to the idea of plan, right? And her plan has fallen apart and she's feeling kind of, oh, you know, very um, flattened by her loss of control of her life, right? So she's, she's kind of a control freak. She doesn't have kids. She's used to really having her environment very much under her direction. And this was not her plan. Okay, so that's Zoe. Um, like I certainly, I guess I should open bracket by say like, you know, um, Every character that you write is part is is some like aspect of yourself. It's something that you can dial into. Like if you can't personally dial into it, you can't really write it. But of course, some are easier, as you as you say, more accessible than others. Um, Mariana is a journalist. She finds out her husband is cheating on her, and she turfs him out. She has young twins, so she's a an older mom. She kind of had miracle twins at forty. She's been working in print journalism her whole career. She's she's been very passionate about print journalism, but she's come very disillusioned about being a woman in journalism. Um, and kind of the business of journalism has she's sort of disgusted with 
you know, the commercialization of journalism. Um, and so she, she, and I don't want to spoil it, but so she just goes in a completely different direction, makes a huge career shift. And a lot of the, of her journey is about figuring out how much she's been defined by kind of her journalistic identity and how much she could change that. Right. Um, and then Beata is a bisexual character. She's a, a woman who is in her, um, I would say probably late thirties. I can't remember what I said she was, but she has a teenage son. Um, uh, the son does not know who his father is. She has always told everyone it was a sperm donor. Um, and it's been very important to her to be kind of, she identifies as a single mom. She's raised this child as her own. Um, but she's a complicated person. She also has a long-standing female partner that no one else knows about. Uh, and all of this is kind of in, she, she has spent a lot of her life keeping secrets, right? And so um, her son discovers that he has a biological father. Uh, and, and that tears apart kind of the fabric of Beata's life because she is sort of revealed not as sort of this, um, her identity, like her public identity is very much of sort of an organic, naturopathic, kind of Reiki style massage person. And that's sort of, she's very into kind of all the hol holistic living and this sort of exposure as, as a fabricator it really uh, rips apart her identity in some quite profound ways and and creates massive conflict around her she doesn't like conflict so um so those are kind of the three different uh people that are having these uh major life events there are others around them too that are having life events that are sort of bouncing off them but those are kind of the three central perspectives and i would say um they all represent kind of aspects of self right um so, you know, as a small example, like I raised, teen I raised teenagers, right? So that aspect of Beata's life and the conflict with the teenage child is, you know, very much part of my day-to-day -day life. I have a very different personality from Beata, but those, the, the, you know, the motherhood aspects, I think in some ways I gave that to Beata because otherwise I wasn't as connected to her as a personality. But I, but that struggle is really central in my life and social in hers. So, so that's a connection with her. Um, I would say with Zoe, you know, I used to be a lot more like Zoe than I am now. So I really understand that kind of controlling, um, like if I just do everything right, it will turn out exactly as I am planning it to be. Um, I lived that way for a lot of my life. So I relate to it. Um, I would say I've like passed uh, the aha moment that Zoe has yet to uh, to hit <laughs> about how much I control. So, but I, I feel um, very, you know, compassionate uh, to where she's at in her life. And Mariana, you know, I'm not as overtly pissed off with the whole world <laughs> as Mariana is, but I do feel like she's a bit like the outer self of the inner rage I've I and like almost every woman I know has been experiencing through the last, you know, four year period plus, you know, menopause, right? Like it's just kind of, she's just to the nth degree. She's just doesn't have that filter. She's just mad at everybody <laughs> all the time. And I kind of, there's liberation in that, you know, so I feel, attra I feel attracted to her kind of complete disregard of social filters, you know? Oh, that's fantastic. And it's, it's interesting to hear how you distill them because as the reader, they were so much more nuanced and built out. And I don't think I could have distilled them to their core pieces the way that you have, because I was so wrapped up in like all of the strings of everything else. So it's okay. really interesting to hear it this way. That's fantastic. Um, I do have a question for you that's uh, a little bit like we'll, we'll see how this question lands because this one like threw me for a minute. So one of the things that you have approached in some of your other novels is the importance of date and time and mm -hmm. the duration of time. And as you mentioned, you're also writing this historical piece. So I'm guessing that date and time are also very relevant in this one. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that I was wondering is that in this book, you write it in an alternate 2020, which at the time was not alternate, <laughs> but so didn't turn out 
quite the way that you would like to. And I'm wondering whether or not in the future, this would be something that like, it has this, this like bizarre new world that we are living in. Oh yeah. Has this adjusted your, your view on writing about the near future? No, I, I love to play with time. I mean, it's sort of something I like to read books that play with time. Um, and as you, as you say, I've done that, um, I've done that in all of my books. So my first book kind of just toggled between, um, past and future. Um, my second book, I did something a bit different when it was focused really on one central character, Avery, and it kept dipping into the past, but at different points in the past. So the idea was that as you dipped into different points of her past along the way, um, you came to understand a lot better why she was behaving the way she was, you know, and it really is kind of a trauma informed. I should also say I'm starting to be a psychotherapist. So it, with Avery, what you're getting is kind of a trauma of informed uh, approach to personality and time where you're, you're kind of getting little slices of the sort of the, the most influential memories in her psyche right? That, that as you get further at the beginning of the book, you think like, why is this woman behaving this way? And as you, hopefully, if I've done my job, as you get towards the end of the book, you're like, oh, I understand, right? It's because of all of these things. Uh, and if you tie them together, you start to understand why this woman is the way she is. Um, and in Better Luck Next Time, the book unfolds over a calendar year, right? And so, so what's important to me about the timeline in this book is that you have the compression of one year it's like the 12 months like you have january february like every month you're getting a, a few chapters and you're learning about an arc of kind of healing and recovery right so in a sense the year itself is important for this book right because it's not about the external events um there were not actually women's marches scheduled for 2020 you know there's a women's march in it so from my point of view for this but people have asked me this but for you know it's some books are very external you know in their in their perspective and and accuracy is super important there so like i'm writing historical mystery right now that takes place in you know five different locations and several different times and one is 1900 and one is you know um like the present day and there I'm much more concerned about what's happening in the external world because it matters can people travel right and it matters like where can they go and what's happening in our conferences being held and you know are they able to access materials and so on right um, but this is a very internal story it's really about you know that what's important is not what year it is but that it takes place over the course of a single year um, so I don't mind that it's turned out to be sort of an alternative reality 2020 because it doesn't matter what year it is. Um, but it is, it, it, like it does for me kind of underscore the central point, which is you don't know what's coming. <laughs> you never know what's around the corner, right? <laughs> we are all, however much we think we've got this thing under control, this thing called our lives, we you just like, we don't. Like there are so many externalities that kind of play into our plans and it's important to make plans. Like I'm a huge planner. I love plans. I love to do lists, but you know, you, you have to kind of come to grips with the fact that it, it could all get sidelined in a minute. And it's been interesting to me to watch how many people have been forced into that realization by the events of 2020 who didn't necessarily kind of have that, um, have that understanding prior to that it's quite a trauma for people who haven't come to grips with their lack of control their essential lack of control over the universe you know to be to be hit with some of the things that we've been hit with this year right although for any of you who are like nope 2020 did not love that year read this and then you can have a different year entirely it's totally worth it totally different <laughs> <laughs> i have to admit like reading it i was like Oh, it's kind of nice. Yeah, this is what 2020 could have been. It could so. have been. It could have been. So people have said that, which I love. They're like, I loved your 2020. I just felt like I was living a different year. I'm like, yeah, sure. Yeah. So for from your one, reality, this is a nice thing that writers get to do, you know? Yes. And it's not like, it's not like one of those like alternate realities where everything is awful and you're like, oh, well, cause that was our lived reality. Yeah, um, so I highly recommend it. If those who need some revisionist history, just jump into this for a bit and be like, this is what 2020 could have been. 
Yes. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I think regrettably that we are close to our end of time. Um, and as much as I would love to just keep talking, um, I'm sure our lovely audience has other places they need to be. And you also have other places you need to be, uh, or at least other rooms. None of us have anywhere to go. I mean, let's be serious about that in Ontario, yeah. but, um, I, uh, I'm sure there are, I should get back to my book. Yes, please do. Oh, as, <laughs> Please do. I'm, very I'm having a little trouble writing new material. Um, I do find that I'm a little distracted by the news. Yeah, I can't imagine trying to write in this. Like, and plus, like the entire upheaval of life and our like the strain our children now have, um, both in their own lives and on our lives as we try and parent and work and the like. I can't imagine that is great for the creative process. But well, know, other go. people I think manage it better than I do, but. Um, to be candid, it has not been, it has not been my best um, productive period. However, there is something quite nice about escaping. Like, I, I'm very happy that what I'm writing right now is a historical because, like, I can literally go to Cairo in 1904. I'm like, that's good. I'll just spend some time in Cairo today in 1904. Yes. Uh, let that be Maybe advice to everyone. Yes. Let's all go to Cairo and spend some time in 1904 to prepare for your novel. Exactly. Do you know when it's coming out? Do you have an idea? I don't. I don't. So I'm supposed to finish it. I haven't sold it because um, it's quite a departure and I'm at the end of a variety of contracts, which for me is quite liberating actually. So I'm not writing it for anyone but myself. Um, so I anticipate sometime in 20, hmm, I would guess 2022, maybe the end of 2022. Yeah, excellent. If I were a betting kind of gal. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, fantastic for us, and also fantastic for you that you don't have that pressure. Um, and it is nice. Yeah, I've had multi book deals before, and uh, yeah, I just find my life doesn't lend itself to um, impose deadlines very well because I have I have three teenagers in my house, and it's just always <laughs> right. I don't really need to say more than that, but you can read in that it's just. Um, it's an exercise really in not having control over your own schedule. And it has been, um, you know, you just have to kind of, I'm working on acceptance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've got a six year old somewhere. I close the door and it seems to be a bit magical. Uh, mm -hmm. she knows she can open it. She's six. Like it's not like, but somehow it's become like the barrier. Well, that's good. You keep that going as long as you can. Yeah, I could probably get like about 20 minutes at a go out of this. So like the fact that she hasn't come in in the past 35 minutes is pretty impressive for her. So. I love that you get to do kids books so much. I mean, we have so many fantastic kids and YA writers in this country. And like, they're also lovely people. <laughs> like I just lovely. know many of them and they're just wonderful. <laughs> so that seems like a really nice gig you've got. Yes, I highly recommend it. Also, parents at home, if you're looking for great stuff, check out The Forest of Reading. Uh, I'm going to plug the OLA here for a moment because they're awesome. Um, check out The Forest of Reading because they've got age groups from kindergarten grade one. There's the grade uh, two, three with the red maple stuff, uh, two, three, four. The, I, sorry, red <laughs> with Silver Birch. I'm Red Maple, which is grades seven to nine. And there are some fantastic titles on that list specifically. Um, if you've got those like younger teens who just like need to dig into something, there's some really great stuff this year. So I highly recommend um, parents, uh, your librarians are amazing. Like Rachel, who will hopefully pop in any moment now. Your librarians are amazing and have lots of supports for you as well. And I highly recommend checking out those. And as a parent myself, like, Sometimes you just need to be seen. And in books like this and in Hole in the Middle and Just Like Family, you are you will feel seen I see and I you. highly recommend it. I see you out there, ladies. I see how hard you're working. Yep. <laughs> right. Thank you both so much for taking the time to do this for us. I wanted to do a quick shout out to Furby House Books in Port Hope, yeah. to Alex, who set all of this up and arranged it with HarperCollins Canada. Kate, Ashley, phenomenal interview. Thank you so much. Like from the bottom of our hearts here at the Cobra Public Library, this is going to touch people and I really appreciate you both taking the time to do it. Oh, such a pleasure. And shout out to Furby House. What, you, you know, that is a beautiful bookstore. I visited it and uh, you guys are lucky to have that in your community. It's gorgeous. No bias at all. <laughs> <laughs>